Welcome to episode 302 of the Bonfire Gaming Podcast. I'm your host, Morgan, aka Bon Diesel, and this week we'll be talking about PS5 Pro information and a little drama, more Xbox layoffs, Annapurna resignations, and much more. Before we get started, subscribe to the Bonfire Gaming Podcast on your favorite podcast app and leave a review on Spotify or iTunes, or subscribe to the Bond Diesel YouTube channel to get all of my videos, including this podcast. Thank you to everyone who supports as a YouTube member or Twitch subscriber. If you're interested in supporting this podcast and all of my other content, please check out the link in the show description. Let's get into the gaming news. Let's kick it off with Xbox. More layoffs, uh, unfortunately, probably for a while to be expected, uh, but we got multiple reports from lots and lots of people uh, about 650 more layoffs at uh, Xbox. Uh, it appears that most of these layoffs were in the corporate staff uh, and mostly focused on Activision Blizzard King. Um, in a letter that Phil Spencer uh, sent out to everyone via email, uh, that he reiterated that there were no games being delayed and that no studios were being closed. Um, the explanation, both from his email and just from kind of the talking heads around the industry, is that this is, you know, we're, we're, we're getting up to a year since the acquisition of Activision Blizzard King. They're likely integrating all those teams, all those processes into the Xbox uh, kind of uh, what culture or whatever you want to say. Um, and that's when you start to identify redundancies uh, where you have whole departments uh, and definitely individuals that uh, you have multiple people doing the same thing that um, even in his email, he referenced uh, basically trying to make processes faster, decision-making faster, things like that. My guess is they had multiple people who were kind of expected to do the same thing and make the same decisions. Uh, and unfortunately that doesn't work. So that's, um, this is a pretty typical behavior after a big acquisition, especially one as big as this one was, um, that doesn't make these, uh, these firings and layoffs any better. These suck. You'll never see me depend defending them you will often see me um, kind of explaining them and giving rationale behind them i would argue there hasn't been a lot of rationale behind these the reporting on this though um it, this always turns into even though this move is fully expected uh, makes sense. This is what always happens. This is part of why people hate mergers and hate acquisitions because, you know, there's always tons of layoffs afterwards uh, because of redundancies and, and efficiency things. Um, Tom Warren put out a report. Um, well, he did two things. He put out uh, on The Verge, which is his like kind of nine to five gig, uh, a pretty simple. Um, uh, Xbox is in turmoil. Here's the letter from Phil Spencer and here's these layoffs. He then has this like private pay to read note thing where he went into more detail. Um, and, and what came from that was this, the statement that uh, Tom Warren, uh, a Tom Warren report states that uh, remaining employees are demoralized and are confused about Xbox strategy. Okay. So this is really frustrating for me because um, well, there's a few things, uh, these layoffs suck. There's no defending it. It's awful. It's capitalism. It's the whole, you know, big business, bad thing, you know, profits over people that we, I don't want to say that we've been through this, but we have, right. But the reporting on this has been so interesting. Um, well, let's start with this whole thing where he did this. Of course he had to pay to read it. Um, but this article where he said he spoke to remaining Xbox employees, which I, which was funny to me because it implies there's like a room full of people left at Xbox and everyone else is gone when they're, you know, they have multiple thousands of employees. They, it's a, they're, it's a huge, I mean, it's the biggest publisher in the world at this point. Um, in between Zenimax and Bethesda and ABK and Xbox themselves, uh, they're, they're rather large. Um, 
but uh, he he put out this you know this impression of well the people I spoke to there their you know their their morale is taking a hit which like yeah there's layoffs happening at the company you work at like for sure that's such a vague like of course statement at least in my opinion maybe I'm just being a baby about it um, but what really got my what really annoyed me was this whole like and they're confused about Xbox strategy. I've worked where I work for over a decade. I'm coming up on 12 years. Um, I know, for the most part, everything about my job. I know, a, you know I, I kind of know some of the higher level things that are happening on my team or in my department. I, uh, I would say I'm in lower management is how I would describe my job. It's kind of hard to, to describe. And, and, and that's, you know, my response, that's why I care about if, if there was a layoff in another say department or uh, amongst the administrative staff where I work and a reporter called me and said, you know, what do you think of the strategy of the place you work? Like, you know, where do you think they're going? I would say, I have no idea. And he'd say, or they would say, or how's your morale with those layoffs happening? I'd be like, I'm freaking terrified. I don't want to get fired and have my life ruined, you know? And so like, this is frustrating because, and it's why I talk about a lot in how I, I feel like with these layoffs and with the, you know, Xbox's strategy and, and, the, and the evolution we're seeing with the way they're doing things compared to how, you know, PlayStation and Nintendo are doing things. There's so much sensationalization there's so much uh you know hyping up and, and getting people riled up and, and freaking out um, but there's so little explanation there there's so little you know how could this change of strategy work instead it's is xbox dying you know um the the other part of this example with tom warren specifically and i'm gonna talk about him because one he'll never watch this podcast and two he's the perfect example for what i'm frustrated about he wrote two articles earlier this year about PlayStation and EA doing layoffs. Um, and they were very by the book. The titles of the articles were like EA lays off these workers, PlayStation lays off these workers and shuts down, you know, the PlayStation London studio. Um, and they were fairly, they're, they're fine. They explain what's going on, right? Well, earlier this year when Xbox had another big, layoff when that involved shutting down tango gameworks that involved shutting down arcane austin and involved you know layoffs of other uh, people as well i think it was a lot of mobile team uh stuff with uh abk uh the 650 did also include um some staff on a couple mobile games with abk as well i assume king um and the title of his article back in february or whatever it was was or may maybe turmoil on xbox and then with ye uh, yesterday I'm, I'm recording this on the 13th it was again and more turmoil at xbox so when ea and playstation had their layoffs that wasn't turmoil it was i think the playstation one was literally like they're trying to be more efficient and lower their headcount uh, and i think ea had a similar tone to it but when it was when it's xbox it's turmoil um and it's just kind of the example of, of what i've been talking about and that it, it really does seem like it, it, it this you know the xbox and this kind of whipping boy position of you know no matter how well things are actually going for them uh you know i suspect revenue is pretty good especially with abk and we know that it is from some reports uh earlier this year um you know they have games coming out there's you know overall things are kind of okay but they're also having problems, but they're the same problems it seems like everyone else is having. But for whatever reason, the atmosphere around it is worse. And and I, I've seen a few people comment on this and be like, well, it's different because, you know, EA or, you know, PlayStation didn't just, you know, shut down studios or, uh, you know, spend $69 billion on acquisition. And Sony has shut down studios. They have also... I gotten rid of people. If you look at what's going on with their live service games, they just shut down a game after it was out for like a week and a half. Uh, they, you know, aren't perfect, but that's never how it's portrayed, at least in my opinion. 
And um, I just, I think it's strange. I think it's weird. And, you know, I remember back when there was the whole, like, you know, the, the Xbox tax conversation happening. Um, and I, 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 and to this day, I still don't believe there's like this cabal of journalists and media outlets, uh, you know, going out of their way w- with some planned strategy to take down Xbox. Um, but what I do think is happening is these media outlets and these influencers and content creators who are struggling with getting advertisers, who are struggling with revenue, who are struggling with remaining viable, have found, have realized like, oh, if we, you know, like when we write articles about this thing, it doesn't get very many clicks. When we, when we write articles about is Xbox in trouble, it gets tons of clicks they're just going to go that direction. And and I think Tom Warren and his articles and countless others are kind of really good examples of this whole thing where it's like, I don't necessarily think that there's hate in their hearts or they're, they're, you know, you know, putting an Xbox tax uh, out, but th- there's definitely a, it seems like there's a lean or a reward for some editorialization, some sensationalization, some uh, kind of, you know, you know, keeping everyone on edge, you know, and maybe never actually explaining the things that are going on, maybe never having conversations about how their multi-platform strategy could work uh, instead of just always making articles about like, no games are going to be left on Xbox or, you know, why would you even have an Xbox, you know, which is what we get instead. So layoffs suck. This stuff sucks. The ABK acquisition was a big nightmare for a lot of people in the long run. Um, but I think the way it's been reported on is predictable. I think at this point, you kind of have to assume this is the way it's going to be talked about by these people. Um, but I think that's a shame. I think there's a lot of room here for some you know, actual journalism, for some you know, interviews and trying to get into that and you know, get into Xbox and say, hey, like, you know, you know, you're making these drastic moves, all kinds of these drastic moves. What's the long-term idea? Like, what is your strategy? Like, instead of actually trying to get those answers, it seems like they would rather just talk to, you know, you know, sources and Xbox and get these, you know, hot takes and, and these, these, uh, these, these assumptions of what's going on there. Um, because that's probably easier and, uh, it's probably just as lucrative, and if if not more, um, so I don't know. I hate the layoffs. I wish this stuff in general was reported on better. But what can you do? Uh, Jess Gordon uh, has talked about rumors uh, that the entire Square Enix Final Fantasy slate may be coming to Xbox very soon. This will include Pixel Remastered, Final Fantasy 16, and potentially even Final Fantasy 7 Remake and Rebirth. Um, and with the Tokyo game show coming up soon, it seems like a pretty natural place where if this is all happening, we may hear about it. Um, this has been kind of bouncing around a little bit for a while. It wouldn't surprise me at all. Square Enix has been pretty open, uh, about how they, the, the, the platform exclusive stuff isn't really working that well for them. They see the value on being on multiple platforms and maybe not always locking up their games, with PlayStation, um, it, it's you know the whole argument is always, well, why would they want to put games on Xbox if there's 60 million uh, PlayStations and there's only 30 million Xboxes? I think if you would ask most companies, would you like to make your cust your potential customer base 50 percent bigger? Most companies would say, oh yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> so it's one of those arguments where it's like. Sometimes I feel like there's this attitude around, you know, the all the platforms where there's like 150 million PlayStations out there and there's like 150,000 Xboxes. So, like, why would you ever make a game for Xbox when that's just like not the situation? Um, PlayStation has absolutely trounced Xbox and the hardware sales this year, um, which is a whole different conversation to have. Um, but there's still a lot of Xboxes out there and that's a, a, a very healthy player base or consumer base to target. So 
this would be interesting uh, with the with the Final Fantasy stuff. I'm not personally super interested in it. I kind of don't care. Um, but I think it would be a pretty big moment for Xbox just for some of those conversations of like Xbox has no games or why do all these games skip Xbox when like the explanation seems to often be, you know, Sony's locking them down to their platform. But um, it, it'd be interesting to see this stuff on Xbox. Uh, I'd be very curious. Um, you know, maybe it'd be really interesting to see what would go on Game Pass. Um, so we'll have to wait and see. Uh, Tony Hawk was doing a food podcast. It's actually um, it's called Last Meals. I watch this show or podcast uh, every week. And so when he popped up on there, I was watching it as soon as it launched. And it's funny because I remember him talking about what we're going to talk about. And I should have like tweeted it out myself. I probably could have gotten some uh, hits on it and it just never occurred to me. Um, but on this show, and he, he talked to the host about quite a bit about Tony Hawk Pro Skater. Um, Tony Hawk has, you know, it makes sense, a lot of reverence uh, for video games and especially that video game. Because I think at one point he's talked about that he's made he made more money from Activision than he ever made in his pro skating career. That you know that you know, Tony Hawk Pro Skater the games were his like big breakout. You know I'm sure he made good money off brand deals and winning tournaments and all that stuff. I'm sure he has his own businesses, but um, it, it, from previous uh, interviews I've seen with him, he um, is extremely thankful for for Tony Hawk Pro Skater and Activision. Uh, in their parts and basically uh, giving him generational wealth. So um, basically he talked about the 25th anniversary of Tony Hawk Pro Skaters coming up and alluded to that there's something being worked on. Um, uh, was pretty dodgy about it, but the fact that he was talking about it at all was kind of interesting because uh, if you don't know anything about the gaming world, uh, we typically don't hear anything about it until exactly when we're supposed to. So we'll see if they do something with that. And then the final thing, Xbox is bringing back friend request. I I remember noticing this years ago where like there was, you know, people in the industry who I was like, I'll see if I'll add them on, on Xbox and see if uh, I can, you know, maybe hook up with them or, or even just be in their circle a bit. And I noticed that you could just like follow people and there was no like friend request. And I, and I think they can like follow you back or they get a notification or whatever. And I think some people do. I, I don't know. It's the current system strange. Uh, amongst other things that Xbox is doing or has done over the last decade, basically. Um, but bringing back the just the traditional friend request is probably a good move. And I think we'll uh, either make people happy or they won't know anything has changed at all. Getting into PlayStation, we had the PlayStation 5 Pro revealed in a roughly nine minute video with Sony's serial killer slash Dana Carvey impersonator. Uh, Mark Cerny. It was really interesting because they portrayed this as a, a technical discussion. Uh, just keep that in mind. Um, so the PlayStation 5 Pro will launch on November 7th. I believe uh, pre-orders start in October. Um, it is going to be $699, at least here in the States, uh, significantly more or less in other places, depending on your exchange rate or whatever they've decided to charge in those places. It does not include a disk drive or vertical stand. If you want those uh, all together, it's going to be a little over $800 for the system. Uh, the big things that they pointed out is that it has more GPU power, uh, more ray tracing hardware, and will introduce PSSR, which is their kind of DLSS or FSR equivalent. Um, and it does have a two terabyte M.2 SSD, which is pretty cool coming right out the box. The actual presentation was interesting because it was, like I said before, presented as like a technical conversation or presentation or whatever. Um, but it didn't hardly give any technical detail at all, <laughs> which was interesting. Um, it, it was certainly basically talked about how it's meant to get rid of this quality and performance choice that you've had to make basically since the pro consoles came out in the last gen uh, up through the current consoles and that they're basically trying to give you quality modes at 60 FPS. And that's the idea of the PS5 Pro. Uh, and that's why they bumped up the GPU and the ray tracing tech in it and are hoping that this PSSR um, you know, tech will kind of get them the final mile with most games to be able to have the high frame rates and the high quality. We'll have to wait and see. 
Um, they mostly showed these comparisons by showing either uh, quality mode on the PlayStation 5 versus the PlayStation 5 Pro, which is always going to look way better because the quality mode is almost always 30 FPS uh, at like roughly 4K, but often lower. And we presume that on the PS5 Pro, the footage they were showing was 4K 60 FPS solid. Um, I think almost everything they showed besides a few third party games were like The Last of Us 2 or like God of War or Ratchet and Clank games that are, you know, three, four years old at this point, which was kind of weird. This uh, I think a lot of people expected they may give at least a glimpse of a newer game um, to kind of say like, hey, look, look what one of our new games will look like on this. But they didn't. Um, what was really strange about it is what they what they really focused on is they would show like a place in The Last of Us 2 uh, on like the performance mode of the PS5 and then the just the regular PS5 Pro and Spider-Man 2, I believe, was also here. And then they would zoom out until this like really far away spot and show like on the PS5 Pro, you can like kind of read this text on this sign that's in the background. Uh, and on the PS5, you can't read it at all. And it's like, sure, but they're both around at 60 FPS. And that's what most people notice. You, you may have the pixel counters who are going to notice all of, you know, the how good the resolution is and stuff. Um, and there are some games out today, games like Jedi Survivor, even Star Wars Outlaws and some other ones where, you know, you can tell that like on the Series X or the PS5, they're running at like a 720p base resolution and then they're using like FSR or some other tech to upscale it to 4K or whatever. And it looks muddy and, and pretty blurry and not great. And so the PS5 Pro is, uh, we assume, going to help that because uh, if you don't know how the DLSS and FSR and I assume PSSR uh, it works is it takes a low quality image and uses AI to make the resolution look better so it'll take a 720p image and try to blow it up to 4k the problem is the lower your base resolution is the the worse the blow up is going to look and so like when you have when you use dlss if you have a computer that can run a game comfortably at 1080p um, dlss in your gpu will be able to make that game look pretty good especially at 1440p will look really good. And even at 4K, it will probably look pretty decent because the base that it's working with is fairly high quality. The problem when you're trying to uplift 720 or even like 480p up to even 1080, 4K, 2K, 1440p, is that the lower your base is, the worse it's gonna look as you make it bigger and bigger. The AI is really cool tech, but it's not magic, right? And so, it, I just don't, I don't think they showed the PlayStation 5 Pro very well. Um, it very well may feel like revolutionary. If you, when you, when people get their hands on it and actually play with it, you know, people may be like, wow, this is amazing. But that's not what they showed very well. And just from all of the, if you watch like the Digital Foundry video about it and things like that, it seems like there is like potential there where there's going to be room to be like, wow, this is better than the PlayStation 5 experience. But then you get into this other stuff, which I have here. So, you know, there's lots of complaints about the price. Um, $700. And that's assuming you don't get any of the accessories for it. Um, it's pretty steep, right? The base consoles, 500 or 450 or supposedly they're going to have a refurb PS5 coming out soon. That's going to be like 250 or 300. We'll see. Um, 700 bucks is a lot of money. And one of the most frustrating things I've seen from a lot of influencers and, and journalists and folks is doing this whole like, well, if, if, if you don't have to buy it. It's like, we, we know, like, we know that you don't have to, we, you know, the, the average consumer doesn't need to be told that you have a choice. We know. And, and the reason they say that is to be like, well, then don't complain if you don't want it or if it's not for you. And, and that's frustrating because it's like, I can have an opinion without being the customer. I, I can look because I myself, even though I'm, you know, a pretty self-avowed Xbox fan was interested. I was, 
I'm a, a potential customer for PlayStation. And if this was the right price and, and had the right features and stuff, they have a huge catalog. I haven't had a PlayStation since a PlayStation 3 Slim. Uh, I have a lot of games to catch up on. And I think that'd be really cool if I could do that because I don't know if I want to wait five years for the PC version to come out. By the way, uh, God of War Ragnarok uh, is coming out on PC soon. And I could completely forget. <laughs> like, there's nothing, there's no hype around it because people don't care so many years later. And so the, the price is an issue and just telling people, well, we'll just build a PC, a $700 PC is going to suck. I know there's people, well, if you get a used GPU and if you get a cheap case, like if you do, a, if you do a PC, you should do it right. In my opinion, you should be spending at least 1500 bucks on a PC, maybe more if you can afford it. But my opinion is that if you can't do that, if, if you don't have the resources to do that, which is fine, a lot of people, most people don't right now, um, then these consoles are a really good option. Um, but 700 is a lot, and especially when it doesn't seem like it's that much more. So then you have like, well, the don't buy it argument. It's like, well, then just get a PS5 if you think this isn't worth it. Yeah, we know. But like, that's not the point. So it was frustrating for me to see so many people being like, don't criticize this. If it's not for you, it's just not for you. It's like, well, you guys do that all the time. Journalists and media outlets and influencers and content creators. But it's like, don't do it when it's a thing I like. And it, and there's also a point to be made of don't do it when it's a thing I'm going to be sent for free, more than likely. I think that's a part of the conversation that might get lost a little bit too sometimes. Is These people are like, well, you know, don't criticize this thing. You know, if it's too expensive for you, that's fine. But it's like, well, yeah, but you're probably not even going to pay for it. So, you know, maybe have some perspective there. Just my opinion. Um, the, and then just like the lack of meaningful improvements. Like there are, there is hardware uplift here. The problem is, is that from try, I tried to do some research on this. I'm not the best at this stuff. So it seems like there's a like 50 to 70% general improvement in how this is going to play games over the PS5. And the comparison is going back to the PS4 Pro over the PS4 and that you were looking at like like 150% improvement because of the hardware that they changed. Like the PS4 Pro and for me, the One X, uh, which was and still, in my opinion, probably one of the best systems ever made, um, were like legitimate, really good upgrades to the base consoles. And this just doesn't seem like it is, at least in my opinion. So... I just don't think they've really shown that yet. Uh, one of the things they did introduce is the PSSR, and there's so much assumption right now by people just assuming it's going to be good. But what that's re it's really easy to forget that like FSR is still not great, and it's in its second or third iteration, FSR two and FSR three with AMD, and then you have you know Nvidia and their DLSS tech, which is really really good at this point, but it wasn't. When it first came out, it was rough. It, it took them years uh, to, to make it better. And so I'm sure to a point, Sony has probably learned some lessons from the, them. And it's probably going to implement some things that will, you know, they, they won't be starting off from nothing like those companies did. But you also have to remember that, like, Sony isn't NVIDIA. Um, I think sometimes people forget that even, like, Sony to Microsoft. Like, while PlayStation in some metrics dominates Xbox... It's easy to forget that Microsoft is like 10 to 15 times bigger of a company than Sony. Sony like makes some electronics and has like a movie division and stuff. Microsoft is one of, if not the biggest companies in the world and does everything. And so when you talk about resources, you talk about NVIDIA too, who's kind of in that, in that realm. Um, NVIDIA's they're a little inflated right now for various reasons, but like NVIDIA has so many more resources and money to pump into making DLSS as good as it is. Sony doesn't have that kind of money. They have money. They're, they're, they're not hurting obviously, but you're, you're talking about two different levels of resources and just the right technicians and engineers and stuff like that, that are working for them. That isn't really Sony strong suit. Um, and so I, I just, I think it's weird that people are just assuming that PSSR is going to be good day one. Like it probably won't be. 
he'll probably be okay for like first party titles that I assume they've been working on this on for a while, but for third party, well, you're going to have to, I assume these other studios and publishers are going to have to implement PSSR into their games. Uh, hopefully they've made that really easy. Right. Um, a part of that though, is that those companies aren't going to do that if there aren't enough PS5 pros out there for it to be worth their time because PlayStation 5 is selling extremely well. It's over 60 million units sold. It's doing really good. Well, the PlayStation 4 sold around 115, 120 million units. And only, I think, about 15 million of those is 15 to 20 million were PS4 Pros. Now, that is what I said before. The PS4 Pro was a really good upgrade and sold pretty well for what it was, even if it was a fairly small part of their overall sales. I don't think the PS5 Pro is as good of a deal and is as attractive as the PS4 Pro was. So if it only sells five, six million units, you know, maybe up to 10, I'd say 10 is probably the realistic high end. Maybe it might not be worth it to a lot of publishers, especially smaller ones and indies and all that to even adopt this tech or to even make like a PS5 Pro version of their games. And so I'm, I'm just really curious because like when the PS4 Pro and the Xbox One X came out, I, I assume that, you know, the, the One X was a little more powerful, but for the most part, I assume most companies and studios and publishers were able to work on those two versions fairly simultaneously and then tweak them for each. But, you know, that was a, that was, you know, a, a bigger base to go after than, you know, just this one thing. Um, and then it came out, Digital Foundry talked about it, and I believe even during some interviews it came out that there's you know that they're not guaranteeing 60 FPS with everything. Uh, even in the presentation, I believe Hogwarts was being shown, and, and the Digital Foundry guys were saying like, oh yeah, that, that was in 30 FPS. Now maybe that was just the stock footage they got, maybe it wasn't representative of how the PS5 Pro is gonna play it, um, but they were saying that like there's a very real possibility there's some games that are still not going to be 60 fps and if they are they're going to have lower quality resolution uh, dragon's dogma 2 is a big one where you know six months later they're just now putting out their first big uh, computer patch a pc patch to improve efficiency um, that game runs like trash on pc i can't imagine how awful it is on the consoles, even the high-end ones. And so there's a really good chance that even the PS5 Pro, even though Dragon's Dogma 2 has already made a big deal of like, oh yeah, we're optimized for the PS5 Pro. I think there's an extremely solid chance that even being one of the optimized titles for the Pro, it's still probably not gonna run a consistent 30, 60 FPS uh, or 4K. It's almost certainly gonna be worse than that, even if it's using the tech you know, that's that's supposed to help. So. It, it, it's it's a weird weird release. I, it'll still sell well. They'll do the Sony thing where that they'll do pre-orders and those will sell out, and they'll put out like a fairly limited initial run of the PS5 Pros, and they'll sell out. And all the journalists, media outlets will write their articles and say, "Oh, the PS5 Pro sold out," and then they'll do a second run, which will be closer to what the actual demand is. It'll still be kind of hard to find because you want to keep that you know, that, that drive going, you know, you want to make sure people feel happy when they get it. Um, and then they'll sell, they'll write articles about that as well. And it's kind of that Sony's done this a lot with the PSVR two to a point, uh, the PS portal, that little handheld that requires a console, uh, to work. Um, they definitely did it with that. Cause it's sales aren't really that impressive, but people talked about it a lot cause it was selling out, even if maybe it was cause stock was fairly low. Um, and it's smart. I'm not deriding them for doing that. It's a smart strategy. Uh, and then the final thing I want to talk about with this before we move on is uh, what Xbox is going to do in return. I did a whole video on this. If you want to check out my YouTube and kind of see my thoughts on that. Um, but I, I think Xbox is going to stick with not with no answer here. I, I suspect that for the last at least three or four years, they've probably been saying, Hey, you know, the, the, let's not do mid gen this time. Let's not do a series X one X or whatever they would call it. Um, a series X X. Um, let's work on the next thing. And there, there's been rumors for a long time that they may try to release hardware as soon as 2026 that would have the, you know, Zen three, you know, CPUs or the RDNA five GPUs that aren't even out yet, but will be by then, um, that they may try to do a big jump and get out ahead 
a year or two ahead of Sony when they released the PS6. There's, especially with this PS5 Pro, I would say it's a pretty good chance the PS6 isn't coming out till 27 or 28, and you're going to have an Xbox that probably has the ability to release before that. Um, and, I, and I've had people push back and be like, well, Xbox doesn't even care about hardware anymore. If they can release next gen hardware a year or two before PlayStation, I bet they suddenly start caring about hardware a lot more and not for profit because and people still forget you don't make money on hardware. Uh, and that's why it's so weird that there's such an obsession of, well, PlayStation's beating Xbox because they've sold twice as many consoles. But then when you look back at those ABK leaks that happened during that trial, we saw that the revenue between those companies is not that far apart. And that's because no matter how many consoles they sell, they're never going to make that much money off of those. It's the install base that you want. But what Xbox does instead is their install base is on the cloud, is on streaming devices, is on PC, is on Xbox, is on old Xboxes that can stream newer games. Like, I think sometimes people forget that part of the reason, and it's on X, it's on PlayStation a little bit with some of their multi-platform games. The, the, the reason Xbox, in my opinion, has broaden their scope so much and not focus as much on hardware is because they realized they could never beat PlayStation in the hardware race years ago, probably with the Xbox one, probably before that. And so what they did instead is they opened it up. Um, but that doesn't mean they don't care about hardware at all. You know, and, and Xbox is still where they make the most money per purchase, right? It's still the easiest way to access Xbox game pass. It's still like, the best way to get into Xbox is a Series X, in my opinion, uh, and likely will still be true when they release the next set of hardware. And so um, it, it's it's interesting that it seems like they're going to skip. PlayStation's going ahead with this. I truly believe we're about to have Nintendo release new hardware in the spring. Uh, that's going to be probably from like a gen and a half ago, but no one's going to care, and it's going to sell 100 million units. We have the PlayStation releasing the Pro now this year, probably a PS6 in like four years. Um, and then we're going to have Xbox kind of chilling and potentially releasing like a handheld and a next gen box in a couple years. Uh, maybe I have no idea. And we're really going to more than ever have these three platforms going for different things more than they ever have in their platform strategies and on different places when it comes to their hardware and where they're at technologically i feel bad for the studios i feel bad for the publishers actually no one feels bad for publishers but the studios who are gonna have to try to make games for this like switch 1.5 and the playstation 5 pro and the xbox whatever their you know series z or whatever they're gonna call it and then the ps6 after that and that's probably going to get pretty tumultuous. I, I feel bad for people in that realm, but uh, I think it's interesting. It's, it's a really fun time in the industry. I'm really curious to how the PS5 Pro actually sells. Um, it, it'll be interesting to see how that goes. Uh, I'll be curious to what Xbox does. I'll be interested in how Nintendo continues to ignore everything they're doing uh, with PlayStation and Xbox and just does their own thing and makes more money than you can even imagine doing that. Um, it's... Um, it's interesting times. In other news for PlayStation, they did increase the price of the DualSense controller in the US by five bucks. Uh, that's why leading up to this announcement of the Pro, I saw people being like, oh, I bet they're gonna drop the prices of the uh, existing consoles and then they'll make the Pro like 499. And when I, in a couple days before they raised the price of that DualSense, I was like, I was like, oh no. Because by this point in the generation, prices should be dropping on hardware for sure. But they're not, they're going up. And, um, uh, when I saw that, I remember having this like little tickle in my belly of like, oh man, the pro is going to be super expensive and they're not going to cut the price of the PS fives and they haven't, they're not going to, as far as we know. So, um, I think it's super interesting. I, I, I thought the most realistic scenario for the pro for me was it was going to be five ninety nine, and then they were going to drop the PS fives like a hundred bucks. Um, now. Xbox has an opportunity to basically do that, to make the Series X cheaper, to make the Series S even cheaper. Um, but so far, they haven't announced that, and maybe they won't. I think that right now would be a good time to try to entice some PlayStation folks to invest in another platform, at least just a little bit, maybe just for Game Pass. Uh, but so far, it doesn't look like they're taking advantage of that. So we'll have to wait and see if they do. 
Uh, and then there was a real weird thing by an ex Sony computer entertainment, uh, EU president who said that the laid off developers in the last couple of years should drive for Uber for a while while they wait for the industry to stabilize. This dude doesn't represent Sony. I'm not trying to put this out, out there as a dunk on Sony. Uh, it's just who he happened to use to work for. Uh, but this attitude really blows, man. Um, it, it's such a bummer. And a lot of the conversation I've seen, and, and I agree with it completely, is that the brain drain happening in the game industry right now is really going to hurt us. We're going to be in a situation in the next 10 years where a bunch of veteran devs are retired or they're out of the industry and there's not going to be any new veteran devs to replace them because they all got laid off and got out of the industry and found an industry where their skills are paid better and more respected. Uh, unfortunately, basically anything in the tech industry outside of gaming, especially uh, is just as tumultuous. So I, I don't want to understate that just the being in tech in general is kind of a nightmare. It seems like, especially with layoffs, it's not unique to gaming. It's obviously what we see the most though, but I still do believe that this craziness is absolutely leading to lots of people just getting out of gaming entirely. So tell them go do Uber rides is probably not the way to address it, but yeah. And then with Nintendo, there's uh, there was a very vague rumor I saw going around that the new Nintendo hardware may be 400 bucks and will release in late spring or early summer. Um, that sounds about right. Um, I've seen people think that it's definitely gonna be like 300. I doubt it. I still think that those rumors that came up a couple years ago that they finalized the tech they're gonna be using like two or three years ago is probably still true. Um, so maybe if that tech is cheaper now than it was then. Maybe they'll be able to get down to that $300 price point um, with what's coming next. I highly doubt it. I think that it's going to be $399, um, and I think that it's not going to really matter. I think people are going to buy them like crazy. Uh, supposedly, part of why they're not releasing until next year is because they want to try to have enough stock to meet uh, the demand and to try to curb uh resellers and stuff like that and don't think they're doing that to be consumer friendly they are 100 percent doing that because they want to get as much of the cut as they can uh nintendo especially but all businesses don't want to let other people get part of their cut so um you know keep that in mind but yeah i'm gonna be curious this the the new nintendo hardware is going to be very interesting with if it really is going to have the DLSS and, and what kind of screen it's going to have and what kind of power it's really going to have, if it's going to be relevant in modern gaming at all, or if they're just going to do what they did with the Switch, basically, and basically just make it a Nintendo box. And that was wildly successful. So it's not like that would even be a bad thing. So we'll have to wait and see. Moving into non the big three platform news, uh, Annapurna Interactive is shutting down, presumably, because every single employee there resigned. Uh, this was in the midst of, uh, I guess, so Annapurna Interactive, I believe, is like uh, the, the developer side of Annapurna when it comes to video games and like managing that stuff. Um, and they were trying to merge that into their publishing part of Annapurna with games who does like, just like media in general. So Annapurna still exists. Um, but they were trying to merge interactive into the main company. The people there didn't want that. We're actually trying to negotiate a buyout to be able to go independent. That obviously didn't work out. So they all resigned. Um, people were freaking out about like, uh, just recently, we found out that like uh, Alan Wake or Remedy in general was working with Annapurna on like a finance deal to make like Control 2 and stuff. Supposedly that's safe. Nothing was changed with that, but it's still strange. And Annapurna is a real darling in the industry. And to see them having the same problems as everyone else is maybe comforting a little bit, but also really depressing. So, <laughs> so good luck to all of that to see what's going on there. Uh, Konami acknowledges a Metal Gear Solid Collection 2, uh, Volume 2, uh, but hasn't really clarified exactly what it would include. And But they have you know, mentioned that they don't want to make the same mistakes they made with Volume 1. Uh, my impression is that Volume 1 was like neat, but it was pretty ho-hum. It wasn't really the most impressive uh, remaster in the world of those games, uh, even though it was nice to have them on modern consoles. So, you know, supposedly they're going to be trying to 
uh, you know, bump up the uh, the quality a bit, uh, especially tough for them when they're about to release the Snake Eater remake, which looks amazing and is going to be kind of a, a standard um, <laughs> that they just can't keep. So uh, we have Flappy Bird is returning, uh, but it's super dark because apparently the IP was dormant for so long that a uh, Web3 NFT bro uh, acquired it. Um, it's a bummer because the original creator ended up actually pulling the game uh, from like mobile stores and stuff because he was like too stressed out by how popular it got. Um, and uh, as far as I can tell that the original creator won't be compensated in any way. He has lost control of the IP and that super sucks. So, uh, and then a investor group is trying to encourage Ubisoft to go independent again and not be publicly traded after their stock prices dropped hilariously bad. Um, it seems like they're basically just lacking revenue. They haven't really been releasing that many games. I think Star Wars Outlaws was really, really good, but I suspect it probably isn't selling extremely well. Um, and they haven't had, you know, they, they will have an Assassin's Creed soon, but they haven't had like a Far Cry in a while. Rainbow Six Siege is still trucking along, but surely isn't as popular as it once was. I just, you know... Ubisoft is probably in a weird spot. I certainly hope that Tencent is in, uh, or not Tencent, but uh, all the whatever the bad company was that was trying to uh, acquire them years ago, that they're not lurking around waiting for something. Uh, Bungie announced a bunch of changes to the Destiny 2 roadmap and where they're moving forward. I don't know anything about this, so I kind of touch base with some people in my community who seem to know Destiny 2 a little bit better, and that it seems like it's just pretty lackluster that. Uh, it's cool that they're going to keep doing stuff, but that the stuff doesn't seem all that enticing uh, and that that game is going very much in the kind of maintenance mode, uh, maybe like maintenance plus mode. Um, and while they, I assume, focus on Marathon, which is its own issue, it sounds like. Uh, and then I just wanted to briefly speak on Warhammer 40K Space Marine 2. I've only played four or five hours of it. I need to get back to it. Um, very cool game, a very beautiful game, uh, very much it makes me reminisce to the old like 360 era, like not everything's open world, like you just go in and do these missions and blow everything up and tear everything apart and you know, you have big guys with muscles and big guns and you're ripping apart the bad guys. Um, very cool. Apparently the game gets extremely good story wise, especially as it goes on. Um, yeah, I, I highly recommend it. I haven't finished it yet though. Um, it has an open critic score of 82 though. So that kind of got lost in the sauce with Astrobot being kind of a giant hit. Um, I feel like Warhammer didn't get quite the attention. It probably would have if Astrobot didn't also come out in the same window, but it's getting its flowers from a lot of people and I think it deserves them. Doing some quick content updates. I have picked out some furniture for the office. Uh, hopefully the echo will start going away as I fill this place back up. I will have some shelves and to be displaying all my fun little gaming trinkets and stuff that I've collected over the years. Uh, I've got a whole setup going on, so I'm excited about that. Uh, and my streaming anniversary is coming up on the 20th of September. I do plan on streaming that day. I may actually live stream this podcast and then play games for a little bit or, or edit live and, and kind of hang out. So uh, be around for that. I know I don't stream as much as I wish I could, uh, but it is still cool. I believe I started streaming in 2017. So it's seven years that I've streamed, uh, obviously with less frequency these days, but uh, it's still something I really enjoy doing. Just like I enjoy doing this podcast that I am about to wrap up. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. Please consider supporting all of my content by watching, listening, sharing the show, and following my socials or grabbing some merch via the link in the show description. If you have your own topics, questions, or feedback, please be sure to let me know in the YouTube comments in my Discord or hit me up on social media as uh, at Bond Diesel or at The Bonfire. That is all I have for this episode of the Bonfire Gaming Podcast. So, until next time.